So um, today I have a, a continuation of uh, the discussions we've been having on machine learning benchmarks. Uh, this presentation is maybe a bit long, I'd say 20 minutes if I just deliver it, but I don't think delivery is the goal we want to discuss, so probably an hour. Um, so yeah, uh, bear with me. The, there are some interesting aspects. Uh, I'll move fast, but I can uh, stop if someone is interested in any specific aspect. So last time we talked, I don't think, Marcus, were you here when we talked about interactive Gibson? Oh, yeah, I think you were. Just last week you were out there. So last, last time we talked about uh, an environment that we could use uh, to run uh, experiments. But I did mention a benchmark there, but the, the benchmark there I didn't think was very relevant. Neither the authors were pushing for that benchmark. So the benchmark there was just navigation in, in a cluttered environment. And today I'm actually going to do the opposite. So instead of talking an environment, I'm going to talk about uh, a benchmark that could be applied in, in different environments, even on, on that one we discussed. So uh, the paper name is uh, Rearrangement, the Challenge for Embedded AI. <clears throat> and I came into contact with it at uh, Jitendra Malik's talk at the self-supervised workshop. And since we're being recorded, uh, are we recording? Yeah, right? Okay. Since we're recording, I just want to mention it's a paper review and image and text are all extracted from the paper. So full credit to the authors, there is not no new content here. And, and these are the authors, by the way. Um, so it's, um, it's a group of people from, from many universes. Uh, a lot of people working in uh, machine learning for robotics. Or some names are known here, like uh, Jed Deng, Serge Levine, Jitendra Malik. And I think it was released last month. So found this tweet say, talking about the process. So saying this report's a result of 13 to hour discussion over five months with this group of people. So it's uh, fresh out of the oven. And so this is kind of the, the, the overall view. So at the end, I'm gonna give some examples of environments. Uh, in the middle, I'm, I'm gonna specify how we can uh, characterize uh, uh, one of these benchmarks, one of these goals. And at first, I'm just gonna give a, a brief overview. So the goal of the benchmark is to transform an initial environment from a state S0 to a goal state S star that belongs to a set of states S. So S star, the, the goal state may not be unique, but it can be an element from a set of acceptable goal states. So S star belongs to a, a set uh, big S star, which is a subset of all possible states. So here's an example. We have, um, so the current state is this. So the kitchen is kind of a mess. Lucas, I'm, I, I lost you. What is S, the capital S star again? Capital S star is a set of all possible acceptable goal states. And, acceptable uh, goal states? Yeah. The, the star it. means it's a goal. It. It. Star means it's a, uh, a goal, and S is a specific, and S is a goal, is a set. Okay, thank you. Exactly, yeah. So uh, in the right in current state, we have a kitchen is kind of a mess. So you can see the toaster is, is here, uh, the books on the table and the, the fridge is open. And the goal state is to organize this kitchen. So you want to close the fridge, uh, take the book, uh, yeah, put the book on the table and put the oven, um, the toaster back on the counter. And this is one example I'm gonna talk about uh, some. So the primary metric uh, on this benchmark is test completion, which is given as a percentage, so from zero to one. And the idea is that we define a threshold for each object, and then we make a binary test for each one to see if, uh, if we are able to rearrange that object or not. And we can report the overall completion percentage as a fraction of objects which pass that threshold test. So there might be multiple objects that need rearrangement. And in that, uh, metric in that threshold, we can take into account sensible tolerances. So the book doesn't have to be in a specific place. It can be, you know, uh, in that region. And we can also account for desirable uh, robustness properties. So let's say we want to rearrange the room and we wouldn't mind if one or two objects in the room are, are still uh, out of place, as long as uh, the overall room is, is, is neat in a nice condition. And as secondary metrics, uh, there are several things we can add, but one that comes to mind or more obvious is uh, to add the do no harm test. So we can avoid agents making a mess on other objects non-related to the goal uh, to achieve the goal. 
right? So if the goal is just to get a book across the room and put it in the bookshelf, you don't want the agent to just mess up the room along the way, just move the sofa and break a lamp. So we can add this do no harm test to check if other objects have been moved or not. And we can, we can even test, uh, go ahead and not only test the pose, the final pose of the object, but we can also test things like maximum acceleration or forces experienced by objects within the simulator. So let's say we don't wanna shake something very hard because it's gonna, it's gonna break or it's gonna uh, affect the object. Hey, Lucas, it, it looks like uh, the speed of with the speed is not a metric here, right? It's just whether it does it and doesn't harm anything else. Yeah, that, that's right. That could be a secondary metric, but it, it's uh, by default, it's not a metric, but I'm gonna show in the end an example implementation from, um, in Hub.ai from Facebook, where they define the metric as test completion divided by, uh, by length, uh, the episode length, how many steps it took to complete. So it, taking into account the speed is exactly what you're saying, but uh, by default, the paper doesn't define speed as a, as a metric. Okay, thanks. And I should actually start saying that this is not one specific benchmark, but it's rather um, kind of what they're proposing a framework of how to define benchmarks in these embodied AI uh, uh, challenges. So the, there are several levels of abstractions we can think of. Um, so in terms of actuators and sensors, so what we want is to simulate um, something that could happen in the physical world uh, in the simulated world. So in the actua actuator side, the lowest level of abstraction would just be like a magic pointer like you have in VR. So you just have a mouse and the mouse manipulates objects, which is very far away from reality. Uh, the, the second one would be uh, you have an articulated arm, for example, you have uh, the robot, but you abstract some of its um, you abstract some of its movement, like you abstract grasping. So if the hand moves close enough to the object, then it's gonna grasp, kind of like we have in VR today, but you're not actually expecting the, uh, the robot to go and grasp the object of strength. And, and the, the third level would be a full physical simulation. And that's the one we are interested in, that we are you're actually gonna take into account the strength uh, that the agent applies to its uh, grasp in order to, to get the object or not. So if it's heavy, and it doesn't apply enough strength, it's gonna fall. And on, on the sensor, we have the same uh, three levels of, of abstraction. So the first one would be, you have uh, ground truth positions, you, have, you know where every object is, so you have this complete information beforehand. And the second one is the one that's more using robotics today, which is you have access to intermediate representations. So the traditional pipeline in robotics today is, uh, you start from a semantic map. So you, Today is very easy to get neural networks which do semantic mapping and, and can actually classify every pixel in, 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 the, in an environment in a 3D mesh or in an image. So you start from that representation and then you learn how to uh, do action and how to do planning. That's kind of the scenario today. And the, the highest level of abstractions is a full simulated perception. So you don't have access to these intermediate representations. You only have uh, whatever the robot would have access to like a RGBD camera. And you also, you know, even add some realistic noise and uh, uncertainty and perfect calibration to reflect what actual sensors are going to look like in, in real life. Uh, so the sensor is only visual sensors? It, it doesn't have to be. So like I said, this is it's more of a framework and I'm going to define uh, multiple ways of defining sensors. But what, what the authors are proposing is that we move towards that. We move towards sensors that are realistic. And since they're interested in training robots, it doesn't only have to be camera. I mean, but if the final robot only has a camera, then it's gonna be a camera. But if the final robot also has access to a LiDAR, then you could have access to a LiDAR inside the simulation. Well, I think the interesting thing is that when you say full simulated perception, that to me means, I think maybe you were going this way, uh, uh, Lewis, but it means that you have to have the uh, somatic sensory perception too. I mean, it, it, you can't possibly manipulate objects and pick them up just by vision, I mean, it'd be almost impossible. Uh, you'd have to, if you wanted the full simulated perception, you'd, in these tasks you've defined, you have to have both vision and uh, somatosensory perception. Yeah, and uh, I think some of the sensors they mentioned are like haptic sensors uh, as well, for example, for touch, but uh, these are not very common in today's robots. 
uh, is there hard? Yeah, but, but when you say, right? then, then you'd have an intermediate representation, right? Then you say, oh, I might have a whole visual system, but I, I, I'm going to assume that I have some sort of uh, grasping feature or, you know, some, I mean, but, but humans, we, you know, we have to feel these objects. We have to touch them with all these muscles that are moving. I'm just I'm just pointing out if you, if you accept the full simulated perception, I don't see how you can in the task you define how you could only have a vision system. You, you have to have before you have to have a vision and some Yeah. Well, I, just I I agree, but here it's also when they say full simulated perceptions, it's with respect to the robot that's going to be performing the actions in the real world. And sometimes the robot performing the action in the real world doesn't have the haptic sensor as well. But how how can it uh, manipulate objects? That's uh, true. I mean. Uh, Depends on the whatever agent is, right? But if it's someone that grasps, then it's going to have haptic. But just physically being able to move something means you have. It, it just seems like the the task you defined, you, it, it can't be a purely visual task to pick something up and move it. Requires, if you're going to do full simulated perception, it requires some hapticness. I don't know how you could get around that. It's like mm -hmm. what's going to what's going to pick it up? You know, magic laser beam. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I understand. Yeah. Yeah, it has to come through the pressure, the texture, and everything. Like picking a book is different than picking up an egg. Yeah, mm -hmm. and not just that, but just, you know, as we've talked about here so many times, just when you pick up a book, you, you often don't even look at the book as you're picking it up. You just use your hands to feel where, you know, you can reach out and then you, then you oh, this is the spine, that's the edge. Like, you know, you do so much of this stuff without any visual feedback. It's, if you watch yourself do this, it's amazing how much you do in close manipulation just through uh, touch sensors. Uh, you know, picking up your toothbrush and orienting it properly in your mouth is not a visual task. I think it's fine. I'm just saying, if you're going to do a full simulated perception, then that, to my mind, means you're going to have to do the whole thing, so, which is great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So uh, some of the guidelines the, the, the authors propose is one is focus on strong uh, generalization versus weak generalization. And, and the way they define it is the weak one is a system that you evaluate with non objects in non environments. So, both the environments and objects were seen uh, during training, even if sometimes the arrangement is novel. So, if you, 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 you've seen a book and you've seen that room during training, but you just put the book in a different room, that's, that's still weak generalization. And what they call strong generalization is, is the agent's task with rearranging new objects in new environments. So, you, you train it to, I don't know, close a fridge. And now you have to move a chair in a completely different room. So it's a, it's a new test that it hasn't seen before. And they recommend this should be the default mode of operation. Uh, a second guideline is to act based on realistic perceptual input. Uh, so in order to do that, we should add some noise and incomplete perception because that's how uh, it is in, in real life. And uh, like uh, Jeff was just mentioned, they recommend sensing the environment for realistic sensor where realistic means for the robot, uh, robot rather than just planning in an idealized kind of map where you already have the waypoints or you have some sort of map beforehand. I have a, I have a question about this. You yeah. know, um, if you have a realistic sensor, which would be an array of sensors, um, like, you know, a vision system is an array of visual inputs and so on. Um, why do you have to add noise? I mean, they may be inherently noisy, but this, you're suggesting that you have to add noise to the system. Um, yeah, no, but not add as in more than realistic, but they are inherently noisy. Like at actual sensors, if you have, I don't know, like a camera, the camera one in, in, in a thousand times, it's going to show something uh, noisy, like different than it should be. And sometimes this is not reflected in simulation. And then it's a big issue that if you take something from simulation that's perfect, to something in real oh, life. Oh, I see. So the difference between simulated and real world thing. In a real world, you wouldn't have to add noise because the real world is noisy. But you're saying in a simulation, it could be so perfect that you would you might uh, obscure some problems. Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me. Uh, this has been a big change in robotics over the last couple of years. Traditionally, it's been really, really hard to take something that's learned in simulation and transfer it to the real world. And what they found, basically, one of the big tricks is to you just during simulation, you add noise everywhere throughout the system. Uh, even though you might not actually get it even in the real world, you just want your whatever you learn in the simulated world to be much more robust than what mm. the simulation gotcha. itself would, would require. Yeah. And and obviously in the, in the real world, you then wouldn't add noise. It would, 
it, it's a real it's, it's yeah but in the simulation you might have a lot got more it. noise that yeah. than you might actually even have in the real world got it okay thank you okay. But that, uh, I agree with that, but there are two aspects to it. One is like algorithmic implementation. And then in order for your algorithm to perform better, then you can add lots of noise. Uh, and that's what has been done in, in the past few years to solve the problem. Uh, and the other issue is the sensors are noisy and the sensors are imperfect. And that's independent of the algorithm that's from the benchmark. And, and, and this, uh, this in particular, they're arguing that the sensors should never be no noisy. They al always have to have just a little noise to reflect what the uh, reward to be, but whether the algorithm is going to inject more noise or, or not, not inject noise, then that's an algorithmic choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good distinction. And, and the last one that uh, ties into this really well is that they should be transferable to physical words. So one thing, for example, the subject should be moved by forces when possible, most commonly applied by a contact. So like I said, we are looking for that last uh, scenario where we um, we actually want to have like a full, full physical simulation. Okay, uh, these are the characteristics. They argue that this problem helps um, that can emerge from solving this problem, right? Uh, so we are, um, the agent needs to have uh, perception, uh, learn how to navigate environment, manipulate objects, uh, have some memory to where uh, objects were, or it's, it has seen an object before or not, uh, do planning and do communication in the case we're using a natural language as well, which is just one specific. So communication just for a specific case, all the others would fit uh, most of the cases. So so are they saying that the, a language is a part of a requirement of this, this problem, the solution? It's not a requirement, but uh, that's, Actually, the next topic, I'm going to uh, talk about how to specify the goal. And one of the ways to specify the goal is through natural language. So communication would come in uh, just into that. Uh, specific that, seems like a, that seems like a really huge burden to put on this uh, network. Uh, I mean, it'd be great to do it. But you, one way you could do is you could have a, a system learning environment and then come back later and say, oh, it's changed. Let me re put things back the way they were before, uh, which wouldn't require any communications. Um, it, 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 it's true. The communication here is in the sense that to understand language, because uh, the goal can be defined as, you know, move the book from the chair to the table as in natural language. Yeah. But in that case, they can put have to, to understand and, and learn how to tie to the test. But that's just one way of defining the goal, and they're not enforcing that way. Mm. Putting it. And uh, I think we talked about before about the clever benchmark. And that's what the clever benchmark does, right? It's like blocks word, but with language. So you move the blocks, but the, the system instructs you in language and you have to parse language and then convert that into actions. Yeah, it just seems to put a, an extra burden on the whole system when the mini cast, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah, I agree. So while well, talking about goals, I'm just gonna get water real quick. So there are um, several ways to specify the goal. So uh, one, the most traditional one is uh, what they call geometric. Uh, and you do a geometric specification of the transformation that the object should go from, uh, to go from state at zero to state at star. So one example, and I think that's the one I've seen uh, main, mostly used in the examples is the center of mass of the object in the goal state relative to star state. Another one is uh, 3D bounding box transformation, especially if you know you, you have to rotate or move the object around, or full rigid body pose transformation if the objects are articulated, right? Like if you have to close a book, open a book, or you know, like move move some object which has like articulated uh, uh, body parts. And, and this uh, goal, it's likely to be lower uh, dimensional than states because it's only going to include include the center of mass or the bounding box for some object agents or places in the environment that are specified by the goal. Uh, for the rest, you can, uh, you can use the secondary metric of like do no harm and specify you know, that they are not touch or they're not moved significantly, but for the actual goal, for the primary metric, uh, it's only gonna be all those objects which are concerned to, to the task at hand. When you say these are the goals, is this, what would be would be communicated to the system, or is this how you evaluate the success of the system? That's a great question. 
So I didn't put everything in this presentation. That's one thing I had. Uh, they, they highlight the difference between how you evaluate and how you communicate that to the agent. Because how you communicate also uh, hides, um, the agent's not gonna have access to the same way you, you actually evaluate. So when the agent goes and calculates his own reward, if not his, his closer or farther from the goal, he's not have access to the, to the same information that uh, the, the experiment designer is gonna have. So here I'm mainly talking about the, from the experiment designer point of view. How, how are we going to evaluate if the agent achieved or didn't achieve that task? All right, so that makes sense to me. I mean, because th that's a way of saying, objectively saying, okay, did the agent achieve what we wanted to do? But it seems to be this would be a very odd way of specifying what the agent's supposed to do. <laughs> I mean, you know, again, the example of the little messy room, you might say your goal is to rearrange the room as it was before. And that's the goal, the specified goal, but then you would evaluate it using the, the metrics. Yeah. and. And, and the one you're saying is actually the experience. That's the fourth one. I'm going to oh, uh, get into that. That's you just put the agent environment and the agent looks at it and then he sees it messy later and you just say, just put it back the way it was. That's yeah. I mean, because no one way. tells if my wife, you know, if my wife tells me to put something away, she doesn't specify, you know, the center of mass. Or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is an odd way. Definitely like. But, uh, but that's a great way of, of evaluating the, the, the performance. Yeah, but, but in this case, um, it's a way of evaluating performance, yeah, but also um, you'd have to communicate to the agent in some way, which is not very different than this. Maybe you're not going to use the full uh, uh, data that you have access to to evaluate, but the geometric way, you're still going to communicate kind of in that, in this language, huh. which is not a natural way of no, communicating. No, that's, that's very unnatural. Yeah. So, so the second one is a bit more natural, that's image. So you give a visual rendering or a presentation of a, a star, like from a third person point of view, it can be like overhead um, perspective or isometric image of the environment in the go state. So let's say you give it a picture, here's how the room should look like. Uh, the, the issue is that the go image may be under specified. So some two objects cannot, may not be visible in the image or uh, multiple possible uh, valid goal placements can be out of view in that picture, especially if it's a 2D picture. Uh, it also limits our ability to specify that certain objects should be placed or contained inside other objects. So if, you, if you're going to say that, you know, I want you to put this book inside the box, maybe it's going to be really hard to show it uh, with a picture. And a, a way to go around this is that uh, it can also be a video. So the agent receives a sequence of images depicting the goal state. And then you can use the camera post to disambiguate this under specification. So you can show it the book being put in the box, you know. So the agent sees the whole uh, end state. So this is a bit more natural, I hope. It's something that could be done with humans, at least. So uh, a third way is language. And we provide a, a linguistic description of the environment in the go state. So like I say, move the chair to the right of the sofa, or move the blue block to the right edge of the table. It's also typically under specified. Uh, we humans, when we do this, we have this uh, back and forth where we can ask clarifications. In this case, it's just stating what needs to be done. And there might exist several goal states that can fulfill uh, one of these uh, language posts. Maybe there are more than one blue box, you know, maybe there is more than one chair. So it's, uh, it's hard to tell. But still, it's, it's, it's more natural, even more natural than the image one. So the fourth one is experience. And that's the one Jeff was referring to. So you just immerse the agent in the environment in the goal condition, and you give it like a time or, or interaction project so it can see. And you let the agent build whatever representation it deems appropriate to bring that environment back to its state. So the agent's gonna uh, build his own representation. And the goal is to make it as it was before. So like you have a ROM uh, robot, uh, it maps the kitchen before, so it knows how it should be when it's clean. And after you have a party at home, it's going to know where it should go uh, back to, the, the state that it should go back to. And uh, another option in the same line is to immerse the agents in non goal environment. So uh, this is what it should not be. So it learns to distinguish between what, what's important and unimportant attributes of the Go environments. And, and the last one, it's from uh, Symbolic AI. It's to define in terms of predicates. 
So the goal is a set of predicates that should be satisfied in the closed state. And uh, they're all on uh, plate one on table one. And the predicates need to be evaluated somehow. And we can do that through a uh, geometric thresholding of positions. We can use a neural network classifier to uh, evaluate if a predicate uh, is true or not. Or we can programmatically check the logical state of all, all the objects. So either, let's say if the microwave is on or off. And it, it's not a natural interface for humans for sure, but it's it's a being useful interface for systems. Is this really necessary? I mean, if the system can do it based on languages, it, it based on language, would you need would you still need something like this? The bread kit? Uh, no, that this is like an intermediate step towards language, okay. I'd say. Okay, so it's assuming like the language one is harder than. It might be, yeah. and so this could be an in-between in step. Um, yeah, they, these are these are like five alternatives. They're not uh, complementary. Like they are, you is, you use either one of these. So like I would say, predicate is a lot easier than actually doing language, right? I think. Well, the question might be, uh, and I had a similar question: is, is is you know, is there when you read this proposal, is it like, well, here's the end goal: we want to be able to either do this by language or experience, and here are some intermediate goals that we could use. Or is it like, no, we think in the end, predicates are a good way of specifying goals in a robot factory, in a factory run by robots. And so we think that's a, a desirable end goal as opposed to that's an intermediate step to a, a more human-like thing. The second one, uh, the proposal is very open. They don't, they don't uh, put the, the order of things like, oh, language is the ultimate goal. They say here are five different ways. Predicate is really good. It should work. So they, they're not concerned in like putting it's funny because you might, you might end up with very, very different solutions um, depending on which way you go about this. I mean, algorithmically different solutions. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, in which case then you would, you're sort of bif you're dividing or bifurcating your, your research agenda in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, like I said, it's more of a framework to define benchmarks. So yeah, I, got someone, I got it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think that's, it's, it's interesting. It's, I'm not being critical of it. It's, it's just, there's two choices here. One is to say it's the potpourri choice. It's like, well, we don't really know what the ultimate end goal should look like. So here's a bunch of different ways and this could create all kinds of research. Or it could be like, here's an end goal and here's some intermediate steps to get there. If the end goal is to be human-like, then the experience and language ones would be the only one that really makes sense, um, mostly. Uh, but if your end goal is like, it's just a platform for all different types of research, well, then that's, that's okay, but it's a different goal. So it sounds like it's that. It's like, hey, you know, maybe the people who love predicates and they just want to make sure there's a predicate-based system. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I see your point, but I don't think it, they're not concerned about it. it has to be human-like at the end. You know, yeah. the, the more on the, you know, the robot has to learn and uh, let's see what's the best way. Yeah. Maybe the human way is the best one, maybe it's not. Yeah, I, I think that gets down to the, you know, this big, you know, lifelong issue that I've been struggling with and we've been struggling with is, you know, uh, do we, can we, create the true AI and, and so on and, and ignore, you know, the then human like systems and, and it's, or not. So I guess, uh, but I, I have enough sad about it. I just, I just wanted to know what their attitude was. Okay, so uh, moving on to the third step, which is a test characterization. So the, we can define the task in this uh, six different domains here. Uh, so in the agent side, we have uh, mobility, manipulation, and sensor suite. And the environment side, we have interactability, complexity, and dynamic, dynamicity, or oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. And I, I, I'm gonna go over. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Jeff. No, no, I, it's, you're gonna go over and solve this. Wait. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna go over each one. So, so mobility is uh, how the agent moves. Um, that can restrict the re rearrangement scenarios that can be performed. Like if it's a fixed robot arm, it, you cannot move long distance. And also the terms, the available action space, which can, it can range from like discrete actions, the movement like just turn left, turn right, like walk forward one meter to parameterized actions to fully continuous control for each motor. Let's like, say so you have this walking robot and you actually want fully continuous control for how it walks. So this one uh, aspect of defining the task. Second one is manipulation, how, how the agent manipulates the environment. So simplest one, you have the magic point abstraction, you have section-based grippers, you know, uh, you know, actually have a hand or needle stick force applications, which are very common in robotics, you know, just that needle that pushes things or all the way to five finger humanoid uh, grippers. 
sorry, typo here. And this defines the, the, spectra, the, the spectra of manipulation cap capabilities. They form some uh, natural abstraction for re research uh, on rearrangement at higher levels versus lower levels. So if you actually have like a hand, then you have to be worried about uh, like fully continuous control in the, uh, on the hand, how to move each uh, part of the finger. But if you only have like a neural stick force, then you the, the problem is going to be at a higher level. It's going to be more about planning than how to actually you know, grasp the object to move the object. Yeah, I find I find the distinction between mobility and manipulation is, is might be misleading and false. Um, that you know, from a brain's point of view, I'm not sure there's a difference. Um, they're all sensory motor movements and sensory. You know, you're moving, you're sensing, you're even walking is not like it, walking is is in some sense touching the floor and touching steps and um, and and manipulating rough surfaces. It's 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 a sort of a false distinction in my mind, um, which can again I'm looking you know it could lead to you know it could lead to robots to do certain things, but it may take you off track here again a bit. Um, I'm just stating a personal opinion. Now, one thing that's really common in robotics research is uh, when. We are more concerned about manipulation. We abstract the mobility part just using like a fixed base. We just we use those products which you know have the, that base that moves like a mat robots there at Menta, and, and then you can focus on on grabbing and other things. And if we're worried about navigation, and then we might add mobility. But I have seen very few works that have both. Right? That actually are concerned about mobility. So it has an agent that has legs. And is concerned about like manipulating objects that has an engine that has hands. But yeah, I understand your point that you know it's I mean if you look at a brain, right? You know, common cortical algorithm, the, the parts of the neocortex that you know move the limbs of your body, including your feet or and your fingers, are all it's all one system. It's not like there's a separate mobility system and a and a separate um, you know manipulation system. Um, it's it's so from a biological point of view, we can almost say that there may be some differences in details, but Conceptually, they're the same problem. You're moving your fingers is it's no different than moving your body, right? And you're moving around your fingers in the space of a, a coffee cup is the same as moving your body in the space of a room. So it's just it's just when you break it apart this way, and I understand that this has been historically the correct and historically where they've done it, and this may be where they keep going, but I'm looking for things here where the where you know the, overall I'm listening to this and thinking like, oh, you don't want this to be another blocks world, you know. And <laughs> and and I'm sure the authors don't want that either, but but there are things inherent to the way they're describing the problem, which could potentially introduce um, sort of um, local minimum solutions that really don't address the, the broader problem. So I'm just yeah. I'm just exploring it, asking you questions, and then just understand where they're at. Mm. So so the last one is uh, sensor suite you can use a variety of uh, sensor types, um, sensor types like color vision cameras, depth sensors, contact collision, tactile, lidars, microphones. And as before, some scenarios can benefit from long range visual sensing. So sorry about the type of slides up. Or shutter hinge haptic sensing. So if it's an object grasping task, you need some sort of haptic sensing. If it's a navigation heavy task, you need some sort of long range visual sensing. And uh, as, as I mentioned a few times before, the recommendation is to simulate noisy sensors. So if, if cameras in the real world are gonna be noisy, cameras in the simulated world have to be noisy as well. So, so mobility manipulation sensors should are from the agent perspective. And from the environment perspective, um, have interactability. So the simplest case is manipulated objects are just rigid bodies. They have no uh, articulated parts. Uh, well, we can add objects that can be rotated. Uh, we can add object articulation states, like you can see the books open, books close, or the staples open, staples close. And we can also add, add a stowing capacity, like the agent, and that's a very common abstraction that you say the agent has like a backpack with some capacity in terms of uh, how much it can carry, of weight or volume. So if, if it needs to move uh, some books to the shelf, uh, it maybe it can carry more than, than one book at a time, right? Or if it has to manipulate a few things, it has to keep some things uh, outside, like in a, in a backpack, manipulate and then put it back in place. So this is one dimension. 
So the other is complexity. And then complexity is like what needs to be arranged in terms of number of objects, uh, the degree of occlusion or containment, let's say they're inside the box. Uh, the target configuration, how precise it needs to be a specific location. Uh, you want to put the vase on top of, of, the, of the chair, but it has to be on the center or is it okay if it's a little bit to the side and whether ordering is, is important or not. So if, if it's a stacking test, you want to stack something, you know, like you want to put the books on the shelf, is the order of the books relevant or not? And, and the structure of the environment also defines the complexity. Is it an open space or it's highly cluttered? So the agent's gonna have a hard time moving around. How many destructor objects are there? And if you're looking for a specific book in a table that is full of books, it's gonna be a lot harder. And the last one is dynamicity, which is whether objects in the environment are they are subject to changes or perturbations which are unrelated to agent actions, whether the environment's dynamic or not. So for example, you can have the oscillating uh, fan or you can have wind or vibrations which are changing things in the environment independent of the action. So the agent has to learn how to deal with that. And whether or not there are only recordable states. So let's say if you, you drop the plate and it breaks. And, and then that's a change that you cannot never recover from the changes here. The base states that you can go from there. So interactability, complexity, and dynamicity, these are three thing, domains we can characterize the task. And just give you some examples. Uh, so the authors give a few examples on the paper. And there are, I think five of them, I'm gonna go super fast. So one very simple one, so by manual sweeping, you control two robot arms to collaboratively pick up box which are randomly placed on the table and they have to uh, place them in this target pin. Uh, and then in the paper, they, uh, all that specification I've been talking about, like in terms of task and agent, that's for each of these tasks, it's defined. Uh, how, how, sorry, how it's um, the complexity, the interactability, the dynamicity, but in, in short, uh, in just a few words, this is, this is the problem. And uh, inside parentheses here, it's the environment. So these were implemented in different computational environments. So Sapien is one of them. Like Interactive Gibson, I discussed last time, Sapien is like a similar one. That's just uh, the, the, is that just the infrastructure by which they implement it? Is that what that means? Yeah, Sapien is the, the infrastructure, the, the, the like library. A, it's, right? like a, um, it's like a, a, a virtual environment modeling system. Right. Exactly, yeah. It's just okay. like the interactive Gibson I told last time, so mm -hmm. like another one. Mm -hmm. So th this one was uh, a challenge in IROS 2020, I think it was September, if I'm not mistaken. So this uh, cloud robot table organization, and the goal was to do it in a, you could train it in a virtual environment, but you actually test it in an actual robot. And yeah, it's just table organization, and right? you have to move things from one side to another. And that, this also used the geometric goal. Uh, all of these uh, challenges are using that geometric goal setting, which is the easiest one. You know, you just say, you just give the bounding box up where it should be. Does the word cloud mean anything in particular here? Why do they say that? Uh, I think I think it means cloud because uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, I didn't know if the word cloud robot meant something. I had not heard. No, no, it, it's more of a cloud computing. Okay, like it's, it, okay, but. Yeah. Um, that seems to be sort of a, a not important detail then, right? Uh, yeah, no, not, not, not. I mean, if you just said robot table organization, I would have gotten it. And it was like, well, what's a cloud robot? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that was a challenge. So the name was, this was the name of the challenge. Okay. Uh, another one is uh, storing groceries. That's in RL Bench. RL Bench, I think, is it a Berkeley or a Stanford environment? It's, it's one of the most advanced ones out there. And the task here is this, you have this articulated arm and the arm has to store groceries in a cabinet. Uh, another one is room rearrangement that's in AI to uh, Tor, that's another environment. And so the agent, this is more in line with the, what we discussed from the beginning. So the agent has to make changes to the scene by placing an object at different locations or change their state somehow, like close or open the computer. In this case, they only have close and oops. They only have, oops. They only have close, close and open. They don't have other states. And uh, this is a, uh, a way of, 
an example of how it's defined uh, the initial states and where the agent put the computer, the orientation of the computer, and whether it's open or not. So the initial and the final state of the object. Uh, so our last one is house cleanup. That this is the most complex one uh, defined in the paper. That was done in, in Habitat. That's also another environment uh, from Facebook. That's getting a, a lot of attention. And that isn't that might be one we, uh, we should consider because it's integrated with PyTorch, so it makes things easy for us. And in this one, agent the agent spawned randomly in a house and is asked to find a small set of objects which are scattered around the, the house. And it has to place them in a desired final position as efficient as possible. What does the word so spawn? What does the word spawn mean here? Spawn is like you put it, it it's born there, you know. Okay. They meaning they basically a, a new agent untrained is, is put in a random house. Yeah, in a random position. Like it just it yeah. just appears in a random position. But I assume there would be some prior training to that though, right? Uh, yes, so th there is um there's training and testing. So the the same task is done during training. So the agent's gonna go through several rounds of this game of having to find objects and put it, and then you're gonna test it, see yeah. how well it learned, yeah. which is kind of the same paradigm we have in, uh, right now. And so this is an example, this is like a house and it says red and green circles here. I don't see red and green, <laughs> but there is one and two. So it has to move from uh, location one to location two. And, and supposedly there are two different objects here. And so they're using 55 photorealistic scans of empty apartment house. That's from the Gibson data set. I remember last time we talked about interactive Gibson that uses these photorealistic scans as well. So they use the same scans. And what they did is they didn't get cluttered environments. They got empty apartments and houses, which are realistic. And they added uh, scanned object meshes from another object data set. And they added to the rooms like programmatically. So every scenario is a combination of empty houses and inserted objects. You just add a bunch of objects. Some of, some of those objects are going to be pertaining to the goal and some are not. And, and this, this kind of allows for some control generation of training testing, right? Since you can add, you can mix objects and, and rooms, then it gets easier to generate environments on the fly. And uh, the good thing is that all these objects added, since they're, they're not from the scan, they're from these object meshes, they are also interactive. So you can interact with any of the added objects, even the ones which are not pertaining to the goal. So, so the episode, episode is defined by the, the house name, the, the environment name, oops. The agent's ball location and rotation. So where, where the agent is, is born and where he's looking at. And the initial objects location and rotation is how you define an episode. Uh, for Go, they use the geometric Go specification. So they have the initial and the desired position of the center of mass of each object. So they're not dealing here uh, with articulated uh, objects with articulated parts. It's just moving an object from one place to the other. This, this problem doesn't have like open closed book kind of problem. And the agent is this little guy here that, uh, Maybe I'm sure you know it's uh, it's called Locobot, and the agent here is a virtual Locobot. So this Locobot is uh, a very common agent using research, like a low cost open source robot. Low cost, I mean low cost. It costs like six thousand dollars, and it has an RGBD camera and a GPS and a compass sensor. And th yeah, this is kind of what it does. So you can see mobility is just like this. Uh, yeah. It's, well. it's, how do you call this? Uh, like Roomba style kind of. Yeah. Like an arm. And the metric, finally, the metric is, is the success, like it was defined before, so zero to one, but they weight by path length. So they calculate the optimal path, like using like a traveling salesman kind of algorithm, and they weight that the success by path length. So if the agent takes a long time, it's but it solves, it's going to be worse than the other one that solves, but you can do it fast. Uh do they take consideration the grasping because the data set, the UAL data set there has different objects and different shapes and different sizes. And this robot doesn't look like has a grasping. It, it, it does. So this hand over here, this hand over here, it like opens and closes. Looks like it's got two fingers, like uh, two of Right. Grippers. But yeah. they have little small blocks, for example. I don't know what objects they're using from the UAL data set. Yeah, they're, they're not going to move the toaster, right? Well, what? They can. I mean, it's a big robot. Uh, I don't oh, know if oh, we have. Oh. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, I think it's like a, a meter, what is a meter? Like four feet tall? It, it's not like such a small room. I think. I'm just looking at that hand and that hand looked like what was it, maybe six inches or something like that. So. Uh, I'd have to research, but it yeah. But, it doesn't matter, it's just a minor detail. Uh, but, but it's kind of a big guy, so I, I think it could, it could move a toaster. It's gonna have a hard time like pulling a, a sofa, a couch. It's gonna have to pull I it. I mean, up. like I would have trouble picking up a large toaster with one hand. <laughs> you know, it, you might be able to do it by sticking your fingers in the slot or something like that. But, you know, if you take a, a, a big enough box, you can't really grasp it. Well, what I'm saying, the metric success is the path lamp, but they're not including the, the difficulty of grasping the object. Oh. oh no 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 not at all like those are all secondary metrics uh, like acceleration the metric here is just success like whether it got to the point or not and they're waiting by path length but, but they, I think maybe, maybe Lucia, you asking is path link including the movement of the arm or just the movement of the body of the robot right oh i see yeah no that's a good point like they can get there and spend like an hour trying to manipulate <laughs> sure, yeah take an hour to pick that's, up the poster <laughs> it's gonna take a while <laughs> Defending the object may take a long time for grasp. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a good point, Luis. Yeah, so those are DA, I'm familiar to the Yale data set. Yeah. 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 That's funny. No, I, I don't think. Maybe, <laughs> maybe if you wait by like um, number of frames or, or episodes, like which is usually done in reinforcement learning, then you can account for that. Like if you wait for time, even like wall clock time, then you can account for that. Yeah, like wall clock time would be good. Because then, you know, yeah. So yeah, th this is the end. So I really just wanted to do a paper review for now. And um, maybe at some point discuss whether we, we can uh, define one benchmark that's interesting for us uh, within this larger framework. I don't know if you guys see a, a possibility in that or not. So th is this framework created? There is code for this or I don't know, specifications for it now? I mean, or is it, I mean, is it something more than what you just presented? Is it, is it like a series of documents that are detailed? Like? Uh, no, it, it, it's a lar long paper. So it, it's more than I presented uh, as in I simplified a lot of things. So it's a long paper and, and a lot of these things are, are more detailed there, uh, but I don't think it's more than that. Uh, so it's, it's there's, not, there's not some set of code we'd have to work with. It's just, this is just oh, a framework, a framework in which we could specify problems. Exactly. Is that right? But yeah. but all these examples, they're done from different organizations. These examples have code and they have uh, uh, GitHub yeah. and all, and we can get from there. But the, the framework in itself, it doesn't have uh, code or anything. Mm. But I don't know if this room rearrangement kind of uh, paradigm would be something that um, would be interesting you to us. I mean, could you use this framework, but use the, the, the environment you talked about last time and use that code base to implement benchmarks yeah, we, using this framework? We definitely could, yeah. That's definitely an option. Uh, although uh, looking at the environments, I look at all the ones that were mentioned here. I, I, I really like HypeTech and maybe you can speak that at some point. And, and I like it just because how it's integrated by Torch. I mean, it's within the Facebook suite of uh, machine learning. So that's, uh, I can evaluate both, like interactive Gibson versus Habitat, but that's another option. Habitat is this, yeah, this last one here. And uh, Habitat is, the, they're pushing this for VR. You no, know, they have uh, Oculus and all. And they I mean, are, is it important? I mean, is it important that it be integrated in PyTorch? As long as you can use Python to interact with it. Um, no, I imagine no, no. you could use any, any Python based machine learning algorithm uh, framework, right? Yeah, that's true. I mean, it's not, it's not that important. Hey, it, it, it doesn't have to be because we, we, we carry the weights, right? So it can be any. Yeah, and, that, it, you it, know, maybe they think, might have example models already implemented in that. That might be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, we have to see which one is more useful. They are very similar. Like they, they both use the same uh, realistic rune from Gibson, and they both insert objects which are manipulated, it can be manipulated. So one, they do it in different ways, right? But it, it's, the end goal is the same. They, they look very similar to me. So it's more of a matter of like which one is easier to use. And they're both from big groups, right? One is from uh, Faith Elise, Stanford, and the other is from Facebook. So that's definitely it. Um, 
yeah, that's that's what I had. Uh, maybe next time we I can bring a proposal, an idea of uh, something that can be more uh, interesting to us. I know you're not looking at goal specific problems, but they can certainly define something in terms of um, you can, the agent can start in a self supervised way, so the agent is allowed to explore the region for a while, and then it has to solve a task. So it has mm -hmm. to go explore, build the model, and then it can use that model to do some sort of rearrangement. So that, I think that's one way of looking into it. So I, I have a, a you know a, a, a bias or an opinion about how to think about the different problems you might implement. Um, you know, our goal is to to be you know everything we do is on the path to uh, you know real machine intelligence and under the belief that the thousand brains concept of you know many sensory motor models that work together is the answer for that and so when we think about these problems i'm trying i'm trying to imagine like oh what is the biological equivalent that i'd be implementing to solve one of these problems and you could start off like, oh, well, I might start off with a single cortical column. What can it do? Can I define a, a problem, a single sensory motor problem with a very simple sensor and a simple actuator? Or then the next step, I would go, OK, let's create a set of those. Um, you might try, let's create a set that represents a multi, you know, two-fingered hand or a three-fingered hand. And they, they, then you'd have a set of cortical columns that are, uh, that are co-adjacent physically in the brain but they would work together. Uh, you might have a, a set of cortical columns that represent different, different actuators or different parts uh, of the world, uh, different parts of the environment. But I would think, that's how I would think about this problem. I'd want to define a problem that moves us towards that type of solution um, as, 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 to what, as opposed to what makes sounds like an interesting problem, which might lead you to solutions that are sort of that are, that are off track and so most of my comments throughout this through your presentation which i thought was excellent by the way um uh most of my comments were sort of exploring that issue of whether like okay would you if you pursued this goal or this task would it would it likely lead you to the sort of the ultimately correct uh, the ultimate solution that i think is going to be required for machine intelligence or is it going to lead you down like blocks world to like some you know dead end in some sense um, so anyway, that's how I would think about it. I would say like, okay, here's a solution that involves one cortical column. Here's a solution that involves, you know, 10 cortical columns. Um, and are, are those 10 cortical columns representing things that are adjacent to each other, like the, uh, the, the muscles in your hand, or are they representing different parts of a robot? Um, but I would think about it along those lines. That would be my suggestion. Mm -hmm. But I don't know if that was clear. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, it was. We'd have probably we'd have to compromise along the way with something more intermediate. Let's say uh, someone who will only use like uh, like that a subset of the possible uh, subset of the cortical column, so it only has like a subset of the sensor, a subset of yeah, of course, things. of course. I mean, you could start as simple as a single cortical column in some sense. Yeah. I, I think I just think that the problem we pick is going to very much. Um, in some sense, dictate the kind of solutions we could try to solve and um, the solutions we would pick to solve the problem. And, and some of them may be too ambitious. You know, if, mm -hmm. if the solution we said, oh, rearranging the room, uh, the elements in the room, well, that means I have to have, uh, uh, you know, both in my mind, I'd have to have a visual system and a tactile system. I'd have to have articulated arms and articulated uh, body to move in the world. And that's a that's a lot to bite off. It, it might be better to, or we might be able to do that, or we might be better off saying, let's start with a two-fingered hand, and can it, you know, can it pick up an object and, and using your fingers just rotate it and place it back down, you know, in the right orientation, which seems less, in, in some sense, might seem less ambitious, but you're actually maybe um, working closer to the final solution um, mm -hmm. that we would like to get. Um, so I think it requires some more thought, but when you propose some ideas, I'll be looking at it that way, you know, all yeah, right, can yeah. we, let's imagine what the solution would be look like. Can we imagine solving that in the norm, in your term using the principles of the thousand brains theory or not? Mm -hmm. it's too ambitious, you know, or are we, are we trying to manipulate objects without having a tactile system? Therefore, you're going to end up doing all kinds of wonky stuff, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. I don't know how other people feel about that.
Oh, one thing that Subtai added uh, yesterday, uh, maybe you, you can further talk about it, Subtai, is we should be thinking about continual learning as well. And I think most of the problems I've seen so far, they still have a distinction between training and testing. And that's a distinction we want to break, through, uh, break from. So we want that idea that you can continuously learn in each new environment without forgetting about the previous ones. So we would, wouldn't have that train test uh, definition as it's done, for example, in this problem here. Is that yeah, I was just thinking, you know, since we're look, looking, spending a lot of time on continual learning as well, I mean, the existing continual learning benchmarks are fine, but they're all, you know, really constrained and limited. I was just wondering, okay, could we actually look at this as a way to explore continual learning in addition to some of the sensory motor stuff? Um, I think it's a good idea. So, you know, it'd be nice to have something that could really scale to handle everything that we're looking at instead of always trying this you know, one at a time individual benchmarks. Yeah, I, I think that's consistent with what I was recommending in some sense, uh, you know, picking things along the way we know we have to do and uh, using this environment to implement those things the way we think we should be implementing them. Continuous learning is one of them. But then again, you wouldn't want to pick a task where it's continuous learning, but we spend 90% of our time solving some robotic problem in a way that's not, you know, yeah. consistent with thousand brain theory. Um, so. <laughs> You know, even even a single quarter of a column with continuous learning would be desirable, even if it just means, oh, I have one finger I can, you know, or, or maybe a, um, you know a thousand. I don't know what it is. I, I, I'm making this up, um, but you know, but just planning out which principles are we implementing right now, and are they all along the path that we want to go along? Um, so continuous learning. Yeah. Do any of these? Yeah. I mean, do any of these systems come with sort of uh, some set of working models, or um, is there something you can, or that may have? I'm just thinking about what Jeff was saying. You know, we don't want to spend all our time looking, uh, figuring out all the details of exactly how to move each actuator and how to do. But if there's uh, there are existing models that do that, we could kind of just take that body and plug in our brain, if you will. <laughs> um, uh... I don't know if there's anything like that. Yeah, I mean, one way of doing that is just defining an agent with uh, at like a lower level or at higher level of abstraction. Like you can instead of defining like a full legs, you can just define an agent two rigid legs. You know, legs that just go yeah, back and forth. Yeah, I guess what I'm at, yeah, I, mean, I guess what I'm wondering is, is there are there already complete models with legs and all of that stuff working that are already available that we can just leverage as a practical matter? Or do we have to go through and implement everything ourselves? No, no, we definitely don't have to implement. Uh, they are available, and and it's kind of the way we choose to define the problem. Uh, if we can we can decide to do it a full end to end, or we can decide, you know, I just want to tell it, you know, just go there or just pick it up. I don't want to actually tell the forces it should apply to each joint of the arm, right? So we can define the problem on that level, definitely. But that's that, that's our decision, right? Do we want to do end to end, or do we want to work at an, on a higher level. But the answer right, is yes, we can find. Hmm. Sorry, go ahead, Jeff. No, I, I just was gonna be articulate a super nice question, but I think you answered it. There, there are environments out there we could use that may, may not be suited to what we want. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, de but definitely are. I mean, there are agents with all capabilities and we can uh, just import and use those. I, I don't know specifically like how it works in Habitat, but I know out there, there, are, yeah, we don't have to implement these things ourselves. But we should think about it because I don't know, like robotics is moving to end to end. So we should think about what level of abstraction we want to work on. And that's, that comes to the question we talked about yesterday, so that do we want to work on at pixel level or we want, are we okay of just uh, using some neural network to do some sort of semantic segmentation? And we just are gonna assume that that is like view one. So we just plug in a convolution neural network. We're gonna assume that's just view one. That's gonna bring us a nice uh, feature map for you know for that image. And then we're gonna work on that level. Or do we want to do full end trend and we want to go all the way to pixel level?
I don't know if you're Jeff. asking me or Jeff. <laughs> uh, you gave me your answer yesterday. Yeah, George. I gave you my answer yesterday. What was your answer? I have an answer, answer. but what, what's your answer? <laughs> well, you know, he asked me about segmentation maps. And I said, there's no really, there's no such thing as a segmentation map in the brain, really. Um, you know, we have individual cortical columns that are making models of, of the sensory data coming in, but there's no, there's not a pre-processing step where you you know, create a detailed segmentation map and operate on that. So I don't think we want that for sure. Yeah. Um, um, think, but it'd yeah. be fine to have something like a, you know, some complex retina or some, some pre-processing is okay, I think. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think you can adhere to biological principles in thousand brain theory without, by, and you can abandon biological sensors. Um, totally. There's no reason you have to stick to biological. So for example, take, consider a camera versus LIDAR. Well, you know, but LIDAR is not a biological sensor, but there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't use LIDAR for uh, a biological type brain. And uh, so, you know, uh, one that gives you distance and um, direction or something, you know. And so I just want to throw that, from my point of view, if your goal is to you know, eventually implement true intelligence using the thousand brain theory, you could, I wouldn't call it cheating, but you could rely on other sensors as long as you don't violate the basic principle, which is, the, the learning algorithm, the learning system um, doesn't have sort of super built in knowledge about what kind of what, what's being represented out there. You know, um, it's sort of some, it's a basic sensor, but that sensor could be richer than the one we, you know, than, than a retina. Um, or it could be impoverished. It could say, oh, it's, it's not in color and it doesn't have this, it doesn't have that, but it has distance, you know, that's fine. Um, so I, I don't, I don't have any other specific examples, but I'm, I'm just suggesting that we can develop the algorithmic principles um, and choose very novel sensors um, as long as we don't violate the biological principles. So, um, so we could, you know, we don't have to, you know, the visual system is extremely complex and to go from pixel level representation to something useful, we take, you know, a quarter of our neocortex or, you know, 20%, 25% so um, you know that's a you know that's a lot to bite off. <laughs> you know, um, our auditory system is much much smaller. So um, you know, uh, anyway, I, I, that's that would be my answer to that question: is don't try to try to f come up with a, a problem with a set of sensors that we can design as long as we don't violate the principles of the system we want to uh, create, meaning the algorithm. Okay, so. In setting some sort of pre-processing step in the pipeline would be something um, would be something okay, right? I mean, if I yeah, pre-processing step in the in the sensor, and, right? In the sensor, again, if I had a lighter eyeball, that wouldn't be a neocortical pre-processing step. It would be a sensor. I mean, the, the retina is a huge pre-processor, right? That's what it is. It's a, you know, it's, it does all these calculations and so on. Uh, so I'm saying you could you could you could heavy end load the sensor, but the sensor can't be like, oh, I detect books and, and cars. You know, that, that would be, that's not adhering to the principle. The, the sensor could have basic information about distance and, and um, um, maybe even texture or, you know, some, whatever you want to think you could, you know, physically or even imagine a sensor could do, um, but it would be at a, a very sort of autumnal or, uh, you know, granular level, not as a, Oh, this thing recognizes books. You know, it's probably that would be the wrong thing. Um, okay. Does that make sense? Is that you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. Well, what about uh, multimodality? Is that something desirable? Uh, is that is it relevant for us to be looking right away at an agent which has like audio, haptic uh, uh, sensors, and vision? Or should they just restrict ourselves to like vision and, and touch if required for now? You know, again, I, I sort of hinted at this earlier when I talked about, hey, you could have multiple cortical columns, let's say, and they could all be uh, co-adjacent representing, you know, successive patches of a skin. Or you could have multiple cortical columns, each one representing a different sensor modality. In, in some sense, that's how the brain is described. You know, each cortical column doesn't know what its modality is. It's just got some inputs and it tries to, um, uh, figure out what's going on, and it uses other cortical columns to help it figure it out. Um, so there's no sort of, if you think about it from a pure algorithmic point of view, there's no pre-assumed modalities. 
it's like that's that's what the common core algorithm says that in some sense all modalities are, are identical they have they solve certain basic principles uh and you sense something you move something and that's what you sense changes um and that's pretty much it so we could decide for example you could have a multimodal system uh, so i'm guessing anything with multiple quarter if i think from a brain anything with multiple cortical columns is in a sense a multimodality system it's not the way most people think about modality but you know the, the tip of my finger is not the same as the, pa the pad of my hand. Those are in some sense two sensors, two modalities, if you want to call it that. It, it, from an algorithmic point of view, the brain doesn't know this stuff, right? It just doesn't know. It, it co-locates things and says, "Well, I'm assuming I can communicate between them." So you could do a multimodal system. You could do a, a three-column multimodal system. One column doing something about remote sensing that would be something like vision. Another one doing something about local tactile sensation. Um, I, mean, I don't. I don't know how complex of a problem you could solve uh, with single columns on these different these different sensory modalities. So I, again, I'm trying to. Th if you think about the problem broadly, then multi. You know, if you were talking about multiple modality, yeah. But think about it as like I have multiple columns. What are they? What is each one going to be sensing? So it, it could be translated to multiple inputs instead of multiple modalities. It could be Say multiple, again, with? multiple, multiple inputs are the same sensor. It could be, again, I'm saying from a brain's point of view, a cortical column's point of view, it doesn't know that its neighboring column is an adjacent patch on the retina. Uh, it takes advantage of it if it is. But um, yeah, I think, I think I was agreeing with what you said. Is it, is it gonna be extra complicated for us to add, for example, audio right now or Maybe we don't, we just add, stick to vision and touch. And we I think, I, again, I, I'm suggesting, think about the problem you might solve. At the same time, think about what sensors we might want to use to solve that problem. And okay. again, the sensors may not be the kind of sensors we have in humans. So mm. um, audio may make, may make no sense at all in terms of um, uh, some of these problems, right? Uh, then mm. your environment has to have some sort of audio. Uh, on the other hand, I could argue LIDAR is a type of, what do I get from audio? I get, I get, um, uh, because we have two ears and so on, the brain actually gets uh, uh, sort of a direction and distance information. And uh, so that's kind of like LIDAR. So I could argue audio and LIDAR are sort of in the same family, um, mm -hmm. you know, so, but, you know, I don't, I'm not going to call LIDAR audio, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. I think thinking about like in terms of hearing and vision and touch is, is the way we tip, you know, typically roboticists think about it, but we have a little bit of luxury to say, no, that's not really what's important. What's really important is we have a sensor that senses some physical attribute of the world. And as we move that sensor, where that sensation is coming from changes. You know, that's the key item there, right? When I make a movement, what I'm sensing changes. So I move my eye, I'm sensing a different location. If I move my finger, I'm sensing a different location. You know, if I um, if I turn my head, I might hear sounds preferentially from different directions. So, um, I think multimodal. I think if you look if, if, if when we succeed at this, we have to educate the world about this way of thinking. But I think it'll be brilliant when we do. I mean, in some sense, we can say like you know, just think about this problem very broadly and what it means. And and so the names we put on these sensors is kind of not really that important. It's what the attributes of the sensors have. And we can mix and match them all different ways and it's gonna work no matter what, right? So that's the ultimate goal of this. So I think it's a very interesting question. We, we want to limit ourselves to sensors that might be very co-located like multiple patches on a retina or multiple patches on your, your skin, or would we wanna take multiple sensors that are uh, in some sense what we traditionally call different modalities um, and they're less related. Uh, therefore, they're harder to vote you know, between them, uh, but they can vote. Um, um, you know what I'm, I'm saying? Yeah. Um, uh, anyway, uh, these are hard things to think about. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Thanks, Lucas. This yeah, is great. Yeah. That was a very nice presentation. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So, so um,